me, um, I never really wanted to be a coach. It sounds crazy with, with where I'm at now. Um, but I was so focused on the playing. And I think as a, as a player, you're so selfish. Um, you have to worry about yourself. And obviously, you're part of a team, but it's so, so different. And then as a coach, you have to be so selfless. Um, and, and, the, and the the, the transition is, is, is crazy. Uh, obviously, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But probably... I was, think I was 33. I, I ruptured my Achilles in a game for Wellington Phoenix against Sydney. Uh, you know, promptly decided that I was going to carry on playing. I didn't feel like my time was up and, and, and really went hard at the rehab. And mm. it was probably about a year into that that I started thinking, oh, there's, there's a chance I might not play again. It was, it was so slow. You know, I just didn't feel, even when I was coming back, um, you know, it was 18 months odd in and still felt like I couldn't run properly. I was limping. I was, I was scared to sprint. I was like, oh, this might be me, you know, maybe maybe it's time to think about something else and, and, and coaching seemed the the obvious one. I um I sort of finished my rehab, spoke to the doctors, the doctor said, look, the chance are you're not gonna play at that level again. Probably time to retire. So so I did retire. Um in the meantime, I'd been working a little bit for the Phoenix, doing sort of um sort of front of house stuff really, you know, you're in the lounge, you're talking to people, um, yeah, telling a few stories on the mic, those sorts of things. And uh as it happened. During one of those uh, one of those games, uh, Phil Kinsley, the the Warrapper, um, head coach and owner of the club at the time, was was just listening to to one of these talks and saw how he interacted with the kids and everybody, and and that sort of stuck with him. And then the end of the season came, and he and he called me up and said, "Look, I've got a job for you. Um, I'd love you to come and coach uh, the Warrapper men's first team." I was like, um, "Look, I've never coached," and he said, "No, you'll be fine." And uh, I thought about it, and at the same time, I'd actually been offered the Wellington Olympic job. Um, decent job, big club, um, you know, both, both, both big clubs, both a lot of history. But for me, I was really struggling with the transition, and I was struggling to see my teammates all the time. And, you know, they're in the middle of the season, they're having a great time and training every day, and, and I couldn't do that. So they were great with me, don't get me wrong, but I, I was really struggling sort of internally, didn't want to say too much, put a brave face on. Um, and that really led to me taking the Warrapper job. I thought I need to get out of Wellington, um, kind of do my own thing for a little while, um, regroup um, and, and see, see where it takes me. The, the funny thing about it was speaking to Phil um, in recent times, he was pretty confident that I would get back to playing. So one of the reasons he wanted me to coach was that hopefully I'd, I'd turn into a player coach. Um, I think he still still realised I was pretty hungry to play and would hopefully be able to play at that level. So that, that's how it turned out. I did two years of, of coaching for Phil. Um, when I look back now I was not very good <laughs> to be in, being perfectly honest I was probably not ready for it um, one of my biggest biggest flaws I think as a as a player coach was trying to do too much trying to fix things with my playing ability rather than actually coach my way out of problems I was substitute um, at the start of the season and anytime there was an issue I'll sub myself on and try and fix it on the pitch rather than actually saying right sitting down with my assistant how do, how do we fix this What what's the actual issue um, and because I still felt that I was good enough at that level to make an impact, that was that was the easy route. Yep, stick me on half an hour in, sixty minutes in, whatever. So that, that sort of kept us kept us going to start with, and it wasn't coaching. Um, we were putting on sessions, um, we were ticking a few boxes, um, but I look back and we were a little bit fraudulent in, in what we were doing, really. Um, and that, and that's that's I think a lot of people transition like that because they don't know they don't realise how different it is. Um, and, and one of the biggest problems for me was I'd come from a professional environment where you train four or five days a week. So I assumed too much. And I actually believed my players would know all of the basics and I wouldn't have to coach them. Mm. And I'd be sat there watching things go on thinking, surely, surely he's going to change that in a minute. But I was almost too, I don't know if it's too proud enough to the right word, but I, I wouldn't go in and fix the issues because I felt like they must know and I didn't want to be that guy. Um, coming in who, who thinks he knows everything when he actually doesn't. So uh, a lot of things went by the wayside and I certainly didn't, um, I, I feel that their individual development didn't come on a lot. You know, I was lucky. We had a really good team. Um, we finished second the first year, um, but I look back and most of that was because I, I had good players and, and half the time you are only as good as the players you've got. So um, that's kind of how it started. Um and then, you know, you fast forward a few years and you find yourself coaching the, the Samoa women's team. So, so some things have gone on in, in the meantime, and I think I've got a little better. Um, so we can probably go on to that. Do you find, like, obviously the passion for football is always there. Like, that that doesn't evaporate at all. And it must be quite, like you said, a, such a different outlook on the game. 
itself like it's still the same game you're still playing with the same rules but you're just looking at it at a completely different angle and even from the fact i suppose with you being in your playing days playing in certain positions and really bossing those positions but when you come to coach you're then having to coach other positions as well to make it, the whole the whole thing work you know oh, it's definitely. work so oh it's, it's so <laughs> yeah that's one of the things i found difficult as well you know I, yeah. Ask me what to do as a as a winger in a four four two. I could I could tell you inside out. I think. Yeah. Um, even a striker in the in the four four two. Yeah. Go a little bit further back, and and you're talking about defensive responsibilities. If anybody watched me play, defensive responsibilities and me didn't really mix. I didn't, I didn't do too much of that. I was up one of the end of the pitch and, and pretty much stayed up there. So, yeah. um, that, that that took a while, and and I'm still uh, I still feel I'm I'm learning that now. And yeah. I think that's one thing with coaching. You're never gonna you're never gonna crack it. Which is which is great, you know. I, I love that. That the longer I go, the more I realise I don't know, and and there's so much more to learn. And that's that's a pretty cool position to be. And it was the same as, a, as as being a player, but you look at it from a different lens. Um, like I keep going back to, as a player, it's so selfish trying to just learn that one position, make it your own. You know, fight off off teammates that were trying to nick your position. And then as a coach, you've you've got to be looking after everybody. You know, from from one to sixteen, and even the guys that are not in the squad at, at the weekend. How do you keep them? Uh, motivated and uh, are wanting to fight their way back into the team. So, yeah, uh, yeah, like I keep saying, it's 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 fun. Um, it's different. Uh, I, I love every minute of, minute of it, but mm. just still still really doing my apprenticeship. In, in my opinion, long way to go. Mm. Um, I, I sort of look at my football career, and you know, I started at probably eight or nine years old. I look at seven years after that, I've been fifteen. Yes, didn't didn't know a thing about the game. Th yes. Probably thought I did. So I'm seven years into my coaching. Um, do, I, do I really know anything? I don't know. Some people have, have, have put me um, in a position where they hope I do. Um, so hopefully that will that will bear fruit and I just continue to, to grow. Oh, totally. Because you'll find yourself as a brand, like the Paul Eiffel coach brand. And, you know, and, and that's like you said, when you're a player, you own the position and that that's that's the realms around it. Whereas as a coach, you're right, you'll find your position. You know, how, how will you actually manage a team, the relationships, the psychology, the coaching on the field, the admin side, the talking to media, you know, like there's such a massive, um, like you said, yeah, it takes years and years and years. And if you look at the the top, top coaches at even international level, you know, they're in their sixties, you know, they're, they are, they've been coaching, you're right, for 30 or 40 years and they've got, they've got it. They've got their style and they've got their networks. And um, I, the, the one thing I love about coaching is you're right. You can have a great uh, football career that could last up to 30 years and then your coaching will take you on to the rest of until you retire. And it means you can stay in the game for literally your whole life. And if you love the game that much, then it's just a win-win, um, especially if you're still using the brain to learn, teach the youngsters, um, but just look at the game in a different way. <clears throat> you know, I look at football like, like a board game, you know, like or chess or any other game is you look at it at different angles and you appreciate mm. the whole end-to-end -end experience at the same time. Oh, for sure, for sure. And I think as a going back to it as a player when you're doing the game analysis you know you you're almost half asleep when they're talking about the back four um, or I was you know and then when it's into your position or oh, what have I done wrong what yeah. do I need to do better um and now you've got to look at look at it as a collective you know okay what you know what are we trying to achieve what are our principles does it look like you know what I'm what I'm coaching in the week does it look like that on the weekend um, and if it doesn't then you've then you've got a problem um but you know I look at the coaching courses that I went on and they have to actually teach you to analyze a game because I was used to watching a game and you listen to the commentary and you know, oh that's a great shot and oh you yeah, know look at that skill and and then you actually say and I'm, the first thing they told me was turn the commentary off don't listen to that rubbish for a start and straight away that made a massive change and you could actually stop and actually look at systems and distances and angles and it was like oh why have I not been doing this before yeah. I wish I'd have done I wish I'd have done that during my playing career yeah. I'd have understood the game no but you know I'd have understood the game so much better yeah. I think. One thing I try and talk to my younger players in the academy now is start doing your badges. Only low-level stuff. I don't, you don't have to do your A license by any stretch, but yeah. start doing a little bit so that you try to so you get to understand what the coaches are trying to get you to do. If I'd have started doing some lower-level stuff and understood that, I think I'd have been a better player. So I think it's something that's really important. Yeah, I completely agree. It, 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 that's that's a huge plus. You know, it's that intelligence of knowing the whole game end to end. 
to make all the pieces work like a jigsaw yep. puzzle to get the end result. And yes, as a player, you are that one jigsaw puzzle that might relate to some of the jigsaw puzzles. But yeah, as a player, to understand that. And yep. again, comes down to that communication, the relationship management, the how does it all work, mm. not just by the skill acquisition, but yeah, the tactics, the fluidity of players moving different angles. Um, and then I suppose even going along in the future is how does how's the game changing? You know, yep. like as we know now, the keepers are playing more like sweepers, for example, or the yep. wing backs are playing more like wingers. You know, 10, 15 years ago, that wasn't the case. And yep. so it's trying to keep up with that play that not you're gonna mimic that, but you're just understanding that's where the game's going. So how yep. do you kind of piece that together? Almost need to be a futurist and 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 you know, um, look at it from 10 years from now. You know what what could be the innovations can we can we get ahead of the curve a little bit here um you know in my opinion the best of that is pep but what i also like is if you listen to him and and, and i do a lot I, I listen to a lot of if he's on a podcast i try and find it if he's written a book i'm on it um if there's anything on facebook i'm, I'm, I'm listening to what he's got to say but he's always talking about everything's already been done and he steals everything and then he just tweaks it um, and, and makes it fit his philosophy, his game model, and it's it's so smart. And you know, he, he in my opinion is the best at it. And oh. uh, love what love absolutely love watching his teams and the way he tries to get them to play. You know, week in week out. Yeah, and he, he knows his players. He knows the system. Yep. He knows the opposition. He's using mm. technology to its finest. Yeah, it's like you know, you watch Formula One racing is the the peak of the peak of automobiles. Yep. Then you you you're, when you're watching people like Pepper Man City, you're going that is the future. And yep. even even when you track it right back to amateur football or whatever whatever you like, is how do you take pieces of that while yep. they're spending the millions and billions they've got? Is there still pieces of information that you could use? Mm. And knowing your players or your system or the league that you're playing in, then how do you use that best ability? And you might not better get it right first time, but if you just practice and practice and practice, yep. just like being a player, you eventually get there. Yep. Yeah. So true. So you kind of, you've, you've led on, you've gone, you know, you play, you've gone your first couple of years coaching and then you've ended up in Samoa. So, yeah. um, so, so how, how did that happen? And like, what were your first thoughts as the, the, the thought of actually becoming um, an international kind of uh, female head coach? Like, how, did, how were you thinking going from kind of player club coach to, to international coach? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how I got into women's football first, I suppose. So that's that's the next thing. So I got, like I said, I got sacked from uh, from Wairapa. Um, at the time, devastated. But looking back, it was absolutely perfect timing. I went away, had a look at the bigger picture, and said, you know, what did I, what could I have done to, to keep the job? What didn't I do well enough? Um, what would I do next time if I had to restart it? How would I go about it? Um, you know, one of the big things was, like I said, assuming too much, too much, really. Um, so I thought, you know, I won't do that if I have to go back to basics at times I'm, I'm going to and they, they can tell me when they're ready to to move on. Um, I ended up coaching one of the um, a local lady here called Wendy Turton, who's actually my team manager for, for Warrapa. She approached me and said, would you would you coach my daughter um, one on one? So I started, started coaching her. Um, she really enjoyed it, um, put me on to a couple of other uh, young ladies. And all of a sudden it was sort of I had eight, eight players and I was coaching them once a week down in Greytown. Um, under the lights in the in the winter and at the end of that first year they a, a group of them about five of them said look if you end up getting a job anywhere we'd love to come and play for you and I thought oh yeah maybe not really not really interested but you know we'll see what happens and then the Warrapa United women's job came up and I thought oh why not just have a go do one year and 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 see where it takes me and those those players all agreed to come in they got a couple of mates in as well and and before I knew it we had a we had a really good side together really good environment and, and that first season we finished second yeah. um to wellington united had a really good crack at, at winning it the year before i think they'd finished bottom um they'd not won a game i think they got two two draws letting 86 goals scored 12 um so to go from that to, to finishing second was was massive um and probably gave me a bit of a boost because at, at the end of that season i thought oh i've, I've affected a few here yeah. uh, and you know you get some decent feedback and you can see the development from day to day and I think it's different with the with the women. They were they hadn't had, I suppose, somebody with my playing career um, coaching them. And 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 when you're talking here, your playing career means nothing when you're coaching. But to them, it did mean something. It meant that some somebody was taking an interest in what they're doing. 
um, at a grassroots level. Um, and that was the kind of feedback I got. And it made me feel better, to be honest. Um, made me feel like I was actually doing something something good. Um, and the following season, we, we did well again. Um, lost the league on goal difference, which was pretty gutting. Um, but we had a good, you know, we had a good crack. And to the third year, we ended up winning the Kelly Cup, which is, uh, which is Wellington's eld eldest cup. And, and I'm doing my fourth season now. Um, mm. And I've loved it. You know, it's, it's been difficult at times, but uh, generally I've, I've, I've loved every minute of it and really, really good bunch every year. Um, and I think that sort of success, um, and I think it's not just a success, but it's the consistency. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of male coaches dip into the women's game mm -hmm. to dip in and back out again, dip in, prove something, get 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 themselves on something on the cv and off back into into men's football and maybe that's what i thought at the start um but i quickly realized how much i enjoyed it um and could potentially stay in it for good i i don't look at it as a stepping stone i don't look at it as something that i'm doing just to bide my time i'm i, I enjoy it i love it and if the jobs uh, keep coming up I'll, I'll i'll keep taking them um obviously uh with this samara job it's it's something a bit of a bolt from the blue um but i'm certainly looking forward to the to the challenge and you know people have said oh you know do you know what to expect there and, and i don't but i used to play for barbados so i understand island nation football yeah. um i understand the pitfalls i understand how difficult it can be um you know this from the, from the standard of the play from the equipment to the pitches there's a lot that that that, that goes on that is out of your control and I think if you can if you can deal with that, um, you give yourself a chance. So I, I'm just looking forward to the challenge, really, and, and obviously wanting to get out there and, and see what I've got to work with. That's the toughest bit at the moment, not being able to uh, travel due to COVID. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is a bit of a shame. That you're right that, that COVID is just a massive span in the works. Um, so how, how are you using that to your advantage? I mean, are you using kind of how do you communicate with the, the management team or players or like what are you how are you kind of getting in there to have those kind of conversations I, I think covid has enhanced that um actually in a funny funny kind of way i mean before before covid i didn't know what zoom was um you know it was it was always skype so now we've got zoom we've got google meets um yeah. you know you, whatsapp groups i think technology has kind of just gone to the next level probably quicker than it would have done without covid so there's lots of ways we can still keep in keep in touch. You know, I've got a really good team of people around me um, at the moment. There's more that we need to add to that as well. Yeah. Um, but we, you know, we're in the in the process of setting up um, WhatsApp groups. We we Zoom call the coaches in Samoa on a monthly basis. So I'm getting to know those guys um, on the domestic scene before I even get there. Yeah. So I need to make sure that I'm as prepared as I can be and my team are as prepared as I can as they can be, yeah. so that we're all sort of singing off the same hymn sheet. So when I get there we can just crack on and, and hit the ground running and, and we've done the best we can. Mm. I don't want to look back at the end of the, the qualifying campaign and we've missed out by a point or, you know, goal difference and think, oh, why didn't we just do that? Or what, how, how do we not cover that? So I'd rather do, do more than less and, and go, right, we gave it everything. And unfortunately on this occasion, we weren't good enough and, and I can live with that. But if, if, if I feel we've missed something, then that, that would be gutting because I've said this before in, in different interviews, but the, the, the opportunity to qualify for a World Cup, it will probably never come around again, you know, for this group, for me, maybe. So you've got to grab it. Absolutely. You know, New Zealand are never going to host a, a World Cup in my lifetime, New Zealand, Australia. So the chance of getting a Pacific nation to a World Cup, when, when you know, I'll be long gone by the time that comes around again. So let's absolutely make the most of it. Yeah. And I suppose, yeah, also it gives you the time to plan obviously there, there's a time period to plan but you've got to plan it well i mean i'm guessing there's there's probably no qualifiers until early 22 depending on covid situation everything else so it gives you a, a large amount of time to plan but of course you're not playing games to get the best out of your group so there's all the other things as as you spoke before going from a player to a coach you probably didn't understand all the things that a coach had to do you know, it wasn't just, I'll turn up for two hours every you know, evening and, and put on a great session. It's all that other stuff, the relationship building, the making sure that you know, understand how to get this, all that kind of stuff is, it must be really key this year to get that right. And as soon as, as playing starts or training or camps or whatever it is, then you're fully prepared. And then, and then you've probably got a very short space of time to get the groups together, to play those games. And then all of a sudden the, the the qualifying games happen and then hopefully the World Cup as well. So it must be a bit of pressure to kind of um, pre-plan out and look at those milestones to get up to that first game. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I'm, I'm aware that 
I at, my, at the moment it feels like I've got loads of time, but that window is going to close pretty quickly, I'm sure. Um, and the longer it goes that we can't get on the pitch, I think the more stressed I'm going to be, to be honest, because you can plan and prepare as much as you like, but if you can't get on the grass and put your ideas into practice, then you're in a bit of trouble. So um, the sooner I can get out there, the better. Um, I know the uh, our technical director is hoping to get out there in July. Um, he's going to get a lot of stuff, hopefully off the ground. We, you know, we, we chat about that on a pretty much daily basis. If he can get uh, the training started before I get there, at least, um, you know, we, we're speaking to anybody that will listen about getting cameras in. So, uh, you know, FIFA, Oceana, whoever's going to come to the party with a bit of funding. Can we get the training sessions recorded? Um, can they help out with GPS? You know, the more information I've got here, um, the better my planning can be. And then I've not got to worry too much when I get there because we're ready to go. Yeah. I suppose, yeah, it's quite different. If you're an international head coach in many of the other countries, you, you've probably got that data with players playing in league football or yeah. playing abroad. Whereas in this instance, you, you're kind of almost starting afresh. You know, you've got some data to go with, but, you know, when were those last games been played, you know, quite a few years ago? And then with players dotted over the place, it's like you almost got to get that group together as quick as you can to start that off. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it's been hard enough trying to get footage of, of any games. Um, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to watch any game yet. So you know that that's something that we're pushing to get from, uh, I think, from Oceania Football. Um, if we can get the the 2019 games, that would be great. Um, it gives me an idea of what I've got. I know that we're working ever so hard to get a, a database together, obviously over here, um, of New Zealand-based players. If we can get a camp here. That would be massively helpful just to see what we've got, um, yeah, I suppose, offshore. Um, and then if you can mix that with with what we've got on island, um, you've got a squad coming together. Um, mm. But again, that needs to happen pretty quickly. Mm. So if we were to catch up maybe like at the end of this year, maybe just before qualifying games, like what kind of milestones or goals would we be like, yes, OK, I've ticked those off. I'm pretty, pretty happy at those instances, even though you might not play the game yet. <laughs> yeah, well, I was gonna, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, games are key. Um, yeah. game, games are massive. Look, I'd like to have ticked off a camp or two. Yeah. Um, I'd like to have met the players. That, that, yeah. that would be nice. Um, <laughs> face to face, not on Zoom. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd like them to understand how I like to play the game, what, you know, my philosophy, um, my principles, um, you know, uh, the formations we're going to play. Um, I would, one thing I really, really want to do is get there and understand their culture better. Um, you know, I think that's key because there will be characteristics and traits that they, they have that will be of benefit to us. But I, at the moment, I don't know. I'm kind of guessing, um, like I keep going back to, most people I spoke to have said they've got a similar, um, it's got a similar feel to Barbados. Yeah. Um, pretty religious um, community. Um, respect their elders, um, you know, respectful people uh, generally and, you know, love their football. So I think if we can find a way to, to marry it all together mm. um, and use that to our advantage, there's, there's got to be some way. But again, I need to get there. I need to sample it. I need to meet the people I need to taste the food I need to you know get around the communities watch the games that's what I can't wait to do and and, and just immerse myself in it and then okay right if we add that to the principles we add that to the playing philosophy mm. and the training philosophy and we, and we put that all together this is what we've got so I suppose it's you know sometimes it sounds a little bit pie in the sky and it's all words and and I'm not that sort of person I want to I want to get there I want to get on the grass want to get stuff going and so it's I'm finding that a little bit difficult um, at the moment. I, I, don't get me wrong, I like the prep and it's given me some prep time, but mm. let's, let's get out on the grass and, and, and get stuff sorted. And I think when we catch up next time, hopefully I've, I've done that and I'll know what I've got and, and my planning will be made a little easier because I'll know what the, what the group looks like. Yeah, I suppose it must be hard because you've probably got a philosophy in your head or a playing style that from your past experience, from, you know, looking at potential position, whether it's in the islands or qualifying, whatever it is. So you've probably got that in your head. But then until you actually meet the playing group and understand the strengths and potential weaknesses, your philosophy might be tweaked or it might be completely flipped over. But like I said, until you even have a face to face conversation with people and understand how they play and what makes them tick, you're in that kind of limbo zone to go, yeah. well, I just need to do that. And then, and then, yeah. then hopefully you, the coaching thing kicks in and then it kind yeah. of flows a lot quicker. Yeah. But, um, without that, it's, yeah, you're kind of stuck. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's so different. I look at, um, you look at a club team um, at any level. Um, if you've got some kind of budget, you can pretty, you can get pretty close to your, your principles and your plan philosophy mm -hmm. with, with, with getting players in and out. 
Um, you know, I, I keep going back to Pep, but you know, if Pep wants to sign a player for two hundred million, he doesn't, does it? So it's not, it's not a problem if the guy that doesn't fit in with his philosophy out the door, yeah. sell him for a hundred, get the next one in for one fifty. You've only lost fifty million. Imagine that would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> be in that position. But you know, as an international coach, it's obviously different with the bigger nations. But mm. um, with the smaller nations that you know we're talking about in 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 the islands, it's going to be this is this is what you've got. Um, you might be able to pull in one or two from here or there that can yeah. can add to add to the group. But you know, you, I could go in with all these different ideas, and then if I see the level is is, is way lower than I'm expecting, mm. I'm going to have to change things. Um, and, and you know, hopefully, I'm changing it the other way. Hopefully I've underestimated. Um, we, we get a couple in and I go, well, actually, mm. um, maybe they are better than, than I gave them credit for. And, and maybe I'm looking too defensively or, you know, we're not, we might employ a press that we weren't necessarily going to do. Or, so that it's hard to, to know, like you keep saying, until I get out there, I won't know. Um, I've got a lot of, lot of ideas going on in the background. It's almost trying to find two or three ways of, of playing, of, of setting up, you know, um, trying to stay true to, to your principles and, and your philosophy, but knowing that things might have to be tweaked because it, it could look very different. Mm. And I suppose then the, 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 I suppose the next stage is you've got your playing group. You kind of understand those, those, those philosophies. Then you're trying to coach the players in the little space you've got. Cause it's not like club football where you've got them like three or five times a week. You might have them with one offs every couple of months. Then how do you then um, have a relationship with the club they play with to go, Hey, look, you know, club versus country, we're looking at this kind of style of play. The club might have this style of play. How do they marry each other? I suppose you then put on your wire upper hat is if you had a couple of different internationals in your wire upper team and the head coach came to you and said, actually, we, we play a 5-3-2, we press hard. No one comes in, they play a 4-3 diamond formation. Like, as a club coach, how do you then influence them to go, can you please play that way? <laughs> or look yeah. at that must be a, and then because you're talking internationally you're talking there's players in Samoa there's players in New Zealand there's players in other countries like that must be another challenge itself that you, you're gonna have to foresee coming oh definitely I think it's it's so difficult with the players all over the place I, I, we might be lucky in that there will be a large contingent on the island yeah. so again it goes back to getting that buy-in from the local coaches yeah. So the more Zoom calls I can do before I get there, mm. the more visits I can do when I get there, get mm. round to the clubs, find out what they do, how they do it, what they need. How can I help? Um, how can the federation help? What, what, what have they not got in the last 10, 20 years? Well, um, and I suppose if you can give a little, you might get back a little. So those conversations become a little bit easier. Um, and, you, yeah, and the carrot of a World Cup is, is pretty strong too. Um, so... Yeah, got to, got to find a way to sell it to them, really, um, and make sure we, we do get that buy-in. And then you've got, you, you give yourself a chance. It's it's never going to be probably exactly as you want it. Um, but I suppose that's my job as a coach when I do to get them on the grass. If if I only have them for a week here or a week there, I suppose it's, it's, it's working out what's important and what's going to get us results. So, um, again, watching the training, um, watching the games, if we have the game, really making sure my analysis is spot on um and working out what's most important and you know do we need to set up defensively are we going to catch teams in the counter attack are we strong enough to to match them um and play out from the back and be a passing team um you know in the qualifiers so that's something that we need to to look at because ultimately you know it'd be nice to be uh, you know swashbuckling uh playing out from the back and looking great but if if we do that and we don't get out of the qualifiers yeah Yes. There's, there's probably a, a, an issue there. Um, is it about results? You know, again, this is something that I'll probably need to speak to the federation about. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that by hook or by crook, if we get to the to the next stage, they'll be happy, and it won't matter what we what it looks like. But again, does that that goes back to does that fit in with my philosophy? Does it fit in with the, with the principles that you talk about? So it's it's, it's difficult, and uh, and there's lots of different um, ideas from lots of different people. But ultimately, I'm the I'm the head coach, so I've got to make sure that. I do the best I can to get us there as a, as a collective.